Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving to all. As, as Jeff had um, mentioned, I'm one of the pastors here at Crestwood. It's my, uh, it's my honor and joy uh, to open God's Word with you this morning, um, especially those who are visiting with us. Over these next few weeks, we are going to be exploring uh, the mission of God and what it means for the people of God to participate in this great mission of redemption in the world. And so obviously such a, a, a story of grandeur, and yet we will be exploring in the weeks to come uh, what this may look like for us. And so before we begin this morning, let me say a word of prayer, and uh, we'll, we'll unpack God's word today. Spirit, we ask that you might help us this morning as we've prayed We ask that you would convict us, that you would encourage us, that you would put a burning desire in our hearts uh, to be thankful in in the blessings in which you've given to us, that we are redeemed and saved and adopted into your family. And yet from that, we would be a, a people on mission, a people who can't help but speak the gospel into the places that you've called us to be. And to that end, we ask that you would help us. In Christ's name, amen. I'm going to ask you this morning, I'll begin with a question. If you were to ask your neighbor, your coworker, a friend from school this week, whether they believed if Christianity was a blessing to this world, what do you think their response would be? One person who I recently asked over these past few weeks uh, responded with this. They said, it's good if it helps you, but you should probably keep it to yourself. For many, the idea to confront one's beliefs or claims about this world is seen as arrogant, and they bristle at the thought of it. And to be fair, to be sympathetic to some degree, the Christian faith at times has been promoted in an aggressive manner, harmful, disrespectful in ways that has, in some sense, done more damage than good. And yet, however... Underneath the troubling thoughts and headlines that haunt our days and our lives, I find many people in our world are asking the same question. They're asking the question of how can things be made right? What is the remedy for this broken world? And if we were to explore a few ways that humanity has sought to solve this mystery of the world's brokenness, we might look to how we've established religions and rituals to try to please God or gods in hopes of garnering favor. We've placed our trust in technology or political ideologies to save us, and yet we could probably all here say today that in return they have left us more isolated and divided than ever before. Even modern day health fads and trends are attempts at delivering a longer, more enriched life and happiness, which in return we could say is one's salvation. Our world is marked by a a comprehensive brokenness. People are spiritually cut off from God. They're socially separated from one another, and they're physically alienated from the flourishing that we were intended to experience and how God created this world. And yet, one of the undeniable truths in Scripture is that God has a plan that He's working out in history. The story of God's mission is that, that we're going to explore over these next few months is how this great God of the Bible plunges into the darkness of this world to bring restoration and blessing through the good news of Jesus Christ. And he calls us to be part of it, a true remedy to this comprehensive brokenness that we're speaking about this morning. In fact, the echo in Scripture is how God promises to extend his blessings to a lost and broken world and restore his creation to the way he's designed it to be. And so, briefly this morning, I want to look at two main points, and they're these. I want us to look at how we can rejoice in God's unconditional promise to bless this world and redeem this world, how we can rejoice in this unconditional promise. And secondly, recognizing our responsibility in this unfolding promise. So rejoicing and recognizing. Let's begin with thinking a little bit this morning of how we are to rejoice as God's people in this unconditional promise to redeem this world. Well, the story of the Bible is a story of promise and fulfillment. 
It amazes me when I read in the Old Testament, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Old Testament today, but rather than God engaging in a solo performance, God chooses to execute his mission in a particular way. How does he do it? Well, he forms a small community set in the midst of the world to be the nucleus of the new world he is calling into being. Sinful human beings, wayward human beings who rebelled against him and flooded the earth with death became his chosen instruments. As one writer put it this week as I was reading, that just like God composed the beautiful symphony of creation, he began to compose the masterpiece of recreation. But how would he begin this? Well, certainly he doesn't adopt an existing superpower like Egypt. How does he do it? He chooses one man. He chooses a family, Abraham, from whom he would build an entire nation. God sends Abraham to another land where he would bless him so that he might be a channel of blessing, not only to his family, but to the nations of the earth. Your impulse and my impulse is to use powerful tools for important tasks. But God's ways are different. We read read this morning in Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. I'll read it here. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is quite the statement. All the families of the earth will be blessed through this childless couple Thousands of years ago, really? Now, there may be many things that are conjured up in in your mind this morning when you hear the word blessing. I don't know what you think about. The familiarity and overuse in our world has bred a certain contempt and and loss of meaning to what this word means. Maybe you say, what a a, a blessing of a walk that I was on this morning. Or you take a a nice picture with your friends and you put it on Instagram and immediately it's hashtag blessed, right? Maybe the younger people here would understand that. But in simplicity, blessing is human flourishing and the delight that comes when we live according to God's creational design. Blessing is the joy and satisfaction we find when we live in right relationship with God and with others. And so I'd want to say this, if anything in our world is to experience the blessing and shalom that God has intended, it can only come in restored relationship with the Creator himself. In this way, they will display God's blessing and God will, through them, bring blessing to the nation of the earth for his love and care extend to them all. God chooses Abraham to direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord, to do what is right and just. In this way, they will display God's blessing. The only problem is, if you read anywhere in the Old Testament, if you look anywhere in the Bible, In Genesis, the Old Testament, we find that time and time again, God's people fail. They stray from their calling. They wander off to worship other idols. They betray their first love with their creator. And yet, as we've read this morning, we see this God of the scripture who is faithful to his promise. He's faithful to his covenant that he would be their God and they would be his people. Theologians call this the covenant of grace where the offended God enters into relationship with the offending sinner and offers salvation through faith in Christ. God overseeing, watching over this promise that God is the one who initiates and sustains this very relationship with his people, though they have gone wayward. Well, the truth is is that Abraham's descendants could rejoice in the promise that, that was given to them But they did not witness the arrival and fulfillment of that promise as when Jesus came as the true representative of Israel who would stand in the the sinful place of the Israelite people who would live a perfect life, who would die on the cross for their sins and secure forgiveness and peace in this blessing. And if they could rejoice in the promise of blessing, how much more for those who live on the other side of the resurrection, for those who who have read in the words of Scripture, for those who live on the other side of the curtain, how much more can we 
rejoice that this promise, thousands of years ago that was promised to bring salvation and peace and forgiveness and relationship with God would be brought forward. How much more for us this morning as we look at the life of Christ thousands of years later to hear the goodness of this gospel, what what God has done in Christ to save us from wrath and hell and ourselves and bring us into relationship with God. It's incredible. It's God's grace. It's his promise. We who have witnessed, he gave his spirit to the church. We can rejoice in this. And not only us, but as, this, uh, as we look upon this world, the gospel continues to go forth and bear fruit. We think in a world of COVID and hostility to the gospel. We think of the great persecutions that we hear through the world. And we would think with a human mind at times that, that Christianity is being squelched. That, that the church is shrinking. That the gospel is being pushed to the fringes. And what are we to do? And yet we can take great hope this morning that as darkness festers, the light of Christ will shine. That the kingdom of God, that we have a great king who oversees his kingdom. And you think in places like Africa, South America, places in the world where the gospel is spreading like wildfire against all odds. We look to him and we praise him that this promise is continually, continuing to unfold. So this morning we look to this great promise. We see what it means to us that we've received this blessing and we rejoice in God's unconditional promise to redeem this world. But in light of receiving this promise, I'd like to say to us this morning that there is a duty for the Christian That there is a recognition of our responsibility in this unfolding promise. Well, first we learn to rejoice in how God is orchestrating his rescue plan to this world. And if I could give some sort of illustration like the mantra of a school teacher that tells you to first listen to the music. To discern the sounds of the instrument giving you this big picture of what you are about to step into before you pick up your instrument. Well, we, we need to listen and become captivated by God's story before we perform in this great mission. In other words, we see how central Abraham's life was to bless the nations and how faithful God has, bring, has been to bring this great salvation about. But as those who have inherited this great blessing of salvation, what may this require of you? What is our responsibility in how we are to participate this morning in our lives moving forward? Well, firstly, leaving and going. Leaving and going. God's opening words to Abraham was, in essence, get up and go away from your land. It's this clear command to leave a particular place and to go elsewhere. He had to leave his land and his people in order that God would bless all lands and all people. Think of the story of Babel. Directly before before Abraham's call, brought an end to the hope of all human attempts of flourishing and blessing. In essence, blessing would not come through the world itself. As we discussed earlier, the greatest human civilizations cannot solve the deepest problems of this world. It requires a break, a radical departure from the ways and patterns of this world. Abraham's commanded to get up and leave. What might it mean for us today? Well, for the Christian, we may not think about leaving a geographical place The certain truth is that we have been brought out of darkness into this kingdom of light. Listen to how Peter says it in the New Testament. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, a people in exile, But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the identity of those who cling to Christ, those who have faith in Christ. In light of this leaving and going to bring the blessings to the corner of this earth, it seems to echo this great commission that God has given us in Matthew 28 that said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. 
The church has a call to make disciples of all nations, to further the advance of the kingdom through the proclaiming of Christ in word and deed. But this requires a, a, a life of repentance, a breaking away from those things that, that we clung to before Christ. We, we leave them, we repent, and we follow Christ into this calling in which he gives us. This means our public witness in the myriad of gifts and callings that God has given to us is to make Christ known. I read this this week. It's from Leslie Newbegin. He's a missiologist and author and pastor from the 20th century, and he said this. It is not an illusion that, is it not an illusion that constantly fogs our thinking about the church? That we think of it as something which exists manifestly on Sunday, is in a kind of state of suspended animation from Monday to Saturday? The truth, of course, is that Christ, the church, exists in its prime reality from Monday to Saturday. The truth, of course, uh, um, in all its members dispersing throughout the fields and homes and offices and factories, bearing the royal priesthood of Christ into every corner of this world. On the Lord's day, it is withdrawn into itself to renew in its being into the Lord himself. What he's saying here is it's important that we gather together, that we partake of the sacraments together, that we hear God's word together. But we, as the people of God, are commissioned to go in to the dark corners of this world, to the places in which God has called us to bring this light of Christ, to go and to make disciples. It's a weighty call. Christians, as they did in the early Roman Empire, to live out a different story among their neighbors in all they do as a way of life that testifies to the God in which we worship. Listen, I know this morning, maybe as much as anybody, the hindering effects that prevent us from going forth to be a gospel witness, a witness unto the light of Christ. Whether gripped with fear of how we will be perceived in our reputations or social status, whether we have been so insular with our own family and our own priorities that we've left little time for the church and its mission. Of course, we're not neglecting the fact to love and to care and disciple our families. We, see, we do see in the kingdom of God that there is this reorientation of Those who do the will of God is our family. Has that been a priority in our lives? Maybe today we have grown distant and dull to the truth that we have been redeemed ourselves. And so I'd ask us this morning, what is it that has hindered us from being a witness to this world in word and in deed? Have we grown distant and dull to the reality of the gospel? And here on this this Thanksgiving Sunday as we've sung and as we've prayed to draw our hearts once again to the reality of what Christ has done, how we can be certain of his love and his steadfast promise to us, how we can drink deep of that love. So like in the book of Acts, the people went forward that they couldn't help but speak about what they've seen and heard in Christ. We are called to leave and to go. But we're also called to believe and obey. It amazes me as you look at this story of Abraham, of course this was an unconditional promise that was given to Abraham. But at the very same time, there was obedience that was, that was called from his life. In Romans, we see very clearly that he was justified by his faith in God, that he trusted in God's promise. I'm not so sure to be bold to say that God's promise wouldn't have unfolded if Abraham was disobedient. But we see all through the New Testament the importance of obedience in the life of Abraham in the context of this covenant promise. And so are we. So are we called to believe and trust and obey in the callings that God has given to us. Just as God formed the nation of Israel to be instruments in his mission, Jesus assembles the church to be his instruments, to obey and to be the message of reconciliation in the world. Listen to this. When the Apostle Paul uses this language of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5, He is describing not only what God is doing in us, but also through us. We are reconciled to God in Christ. We become a new creation and then are commissioned to join in his work of reconciliation. Paul describes us as being ambassadors on his behalf. We're called to scatter into our neighborhoods and into our workplaces and offer the peace and forgiveness that comes through Jesus, appealing to people. Appealing as ambassadors to turn from idols that enslave them, from things that that have been counterfeit blessings in their lives, 
and to turn to the God who offers true freedom. That's been the experience of our lives if we know Christ. And so how do we act as God's ambassadors with this message of reconciliation? To go forward to our families, to people in the lost and broken corners of our city, and say, be reconciled to God. Believe in the gospel. Know that your sins can be forgiven. Far from securing a physical inheritance, we have an eternal inheritance that cannot be taken from us. This is quite the weighty call. But the call for us is to be faithful. Having this privilege of knowing Christ, we labor, we toil, and sometimes under great, under great grief we wonder, is, is this promise moving forward? Is God using the church? Is the light moving forward? But we can be reminded that as it says at the end of the scriptures in, uh, in Revelation, that John heard a loud voice from the, the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. This is the hope and the promise we look forward to. That he will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God, as our God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who, has, who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Write this down, for these are tr- words that are trustworthy and true. Today we can be encouraged that this is the end of the story. This is the mission in which we are participating in to bring the blessing of God to this world. Let us not lose heart. Let us look to him today. Let us see that God is faithful to unfold this promise in this world. Let's pray. Father, we ask this morning that you, that you might break our hearts, you might burden our hearts to be a light unto the nations, to not be insular or selfish to this message of the gospel that we've received Now, what a privilege it is to be your elect children, to receive the promises in Christ that are yes and amen. And yet there's a, a, a great responsibility to this election, to go forth into the world, to share the good news of Christ. And I pray this morning for those who know you, that there would be a fire lit in us, there would be a desire of this promise to, to, to cherish it, to be captivated by it, that our love for Christ would grow but also for those who don't know you this morning, that they may look to the promises of Christ to see that that is where true blessing can be found. We pray this this morning in Christ's name. Amen.